hand of the princess. Dragon Slayer. I've been looking for a Tikkun there for a long time now, and I finally found it. I had my friend Michal Sofer uh, show me a source, but it didn't actually reference where it came from. It didn't Rabbi Ginsburg's work. But, uh, good morning, Yosef. Morning. Good to see you. I hope you're well. I had this idea that all of romance, like fantasy, Lord of the Rings stuff, comes from the Torah, from uh, Az Tikkun Azir, which was written, I think, I don't know, 1100, I don't know. It's a Kabbalah Sefer on the Zer. Well, it's actually 70 interpretations of the word Bracious. I'm getting it right. There it speaks about the one who wins the hand of the princess. Good morning. How do you... David Melech won the hand of the king's daughter through his valor in facing the enemy. Who's the ultimate enemy? Isn't that the snake? This whole idea of going out to battle the dragon, the snake. snake. We're not talking about a little rattlesnake on the ground. Okay, what was the snake that attacked Maish Rabbeinu? It was so big and terrifying that it ate him from the head to the belly and from the toes to his thighs. See, Pyra saw it, realized what it was because she was a smart woman and corrected the problem and I killed the snake. So what is the snake that's attacking Maisha Rabbeinu? Moses was attacked by a snake. He almost died. Okay, but he, I guess he survived intact. It says that at 120 he still looked, you know, bright and fresh. And after that, too. So what did he look like after he fought the dragon? I think he came out whole and intact. See, Pura got there on time before he was, like, going to be in the gizzard of a snake. So the snake is like a dragon. It's like a powerful beast. Sometimes it's interpreted as dragon, I think, also. You also have, like, related creatures. My, my friend Michal, he's, you know, into Kabul and stuff, and he's telling me about this, that how these monster creatures are related, including, he says, Leviathan is related to the snake. And he had one more thing. The, yeah, uh, the, um, the crocodile, I think, of Pari. I don't know. Everything's related, right? <laughs> if you relate too many things, it starts to, you got to find the common element. I mean, that's, that's what it, it does in the Talmud. Good morning. Wishing you a wonderful day and a lovely Shabbos. Thank you. So the hand of the princess. What is this princess that the Zayers, the, the Tikkun Zayers, is so fascinated by? I'm fascinated by this. It had a long introduction about Sukkot, so I thought that's also topical. I didn't get really the... I'm going to have to learn this on the fly with you. But I think it's going to be worth it because I think this is an awesome topic. But I hope we get to the main thing is what is this he heroism in attacking the ultimate enemy? The snake. If you kill the snake, you get the king's daughter's hand in marriage. I guess you get the rest of her too. Probably, it's like a package deal. <laughs> <coughs> but I guess hand is it's associated with like an intimate contact. You get the hand in marriage. Hand of the princess, dragon slayer. So I meant dragon slayer. <laughs> I'm sneaking in a word. I, I like to do that. That's fun. I like to make things have dual meanings. Um, I find that fun. So, Hand of the Princess, Dragon Slayer. Dragon Slayer, he slays the dragon. And that's what you get. So, what is this elusive princess that you get? I peeped. I, I, th I think I know what they're getting at. How is everyone today? If you don't interrupt me, I'm going to say mo more poetry. I wrote, like, what, four haikus this morning. 
I like strings of haikus because each idea resonates on the other ones. They might have nothing connected. Like I'm, I'm gonna trick you in the final two. I'm gonna give you an idea that you're supposed to have in mind, but I don't have the words to do it, so I just refer back to the previous one. Okay, anyways, I'm self-aggrandizing my, you know, that's what's the point of that. Temple of Flame, candelabras. Okay, is the temple of flame because it's burning down, Chasvisholom? Or are we building up the fire of the temple, which happened in Sukkot's time? So I thought of this. In Sukkot's time, at night, they'd light up all of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the holy city. It was lit from the temple mounts, burning the flames of the temple. Not because it's burning down, but when it's, when it's on fire, when it's a, you know, a temple of flames. So the Temple of Flame is the candelabras. They put these, I don't know, 50 amas high. I don't know how to put, high to put them. Someone look at 100 amas. 100 amas, I think. Like, you, very tall, very bright. And you know what they're burning? The Tachtainim. Literally. Literally the Tachtainim. Any Hebrew-speaking person will know what I'm talking about. They used the sacred garments of the Kohanim that had gotten spent. They wore out from usage because they had to move around a lot, right? So their their um, their undergarments were used, they, they tore up the fabric and they used that to light up the candelabras that lit the whole Jerusalem with the flames. Not a burning down, enough enough uh, morning. We have to have a morning dew, a morning star lighting us up flames after it. so the candelabras it says were so bright that in the surrounding courtyards you could like distinguish between things in your grain or whatever like sifting through your grain because you could see the different colors because the light was so bright so there's a clarity associated with the burning temple which means being excited and happy to serve God okay that means being a good person if you don't like that, in other words, that's how you can interpret it. Be a good person. That light is not the light of destruction. It's not the flames of, of a temple burning down. It's the flames of lighting up the not just the temple, but the entire surrounding area and the whole world got lit up from that. Moonbeams, darkness appears as darkness. Good morning. So I like the word moonbeams because it's also a verb. It's just not it's not just a noun. It's a ha it's something happening. So what does it beam? It beams darkness. Why? When you're in when you see the moonbeams and it's night, then darkness appears. There's a you see darkness. How do you see it? Because you see it as darkness. So the moon beams the darkness in a sense. It's like a verb. Morning dew, one star in the sky. Okay, when morning comes up and the stars start going away, because there's the, you have this yin yang of everything, right? You need the darkness to sustain the light, you need the precious light of the diamond stars in the sky, like a diamond in the sky, right? They're precious and they're small. They, to be appreciated, you have to have a darkness around them. So when you wake up to morning dew, because once I did, I didn't fall asleep all night, but I tried to sleep, and I woke in morning dew, like I was always awaking, being awoken, like the, like, um, Achashverosh, Nadidas Shnas HaMelech, the sleep of the king wandered away from him, it was elusive, he couldn't sleep. So you could, it's, you're being awake, I, that's another, another poem, haiku, that would be a nice one. Sleep wanders away, or something like that, I don't know. So I woke to do, and I was like falling in the Grateful Dead, and I was I was with someone, and and we 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 just hung out on the grass. We thought we we did, we had money, both of us. We didn't want to spend any money. We wanted to feel like we're living off the fat of the land. So we we just after the concert, we just hung out there and tried to stay there the night. I don't know what we planned to do in the morning. I guess we just go off. <laughs> Like we couldn't sleep because there was dew. We didn't have any sleep. We didn't have sleeping bags or anything. 
We had, a, I don't know, maybe a jean jacket to throw on the ground. I don't know. And you couldn't sleep because there's dew. And when it's morning dew, and the, and the light starts like dawn, if it's a one star that lingers there in the sky because it's the brightest star, it's the only star in your world. Okay, there's my good morning. I just finished the whole uh, poetry romantic stuff. But now I'm getting to something that actually is the most romantic of all narratives. The hero goes off to kill the snake. You have to face your, the demons and, and face the snake that everyone's terrified of. So someone who's heroic, and they do this and they kill the snake? The king's princess is granted to you. That's what David Amalek got. It wasn't unprecedented in Tanakh. It happened. David Amalek, our, our hero extraordinaire, he kills the snake. Who did he kill? Gallius. See the snake? Ugh. Gallius represents... Ugh. I heard an amazing share from Robin Wilder Jacobson. That's recommended. But Gallius and his uh, pedigree royal pedigree in some certain, like, some certain extent. So I'm going to go try and go through a very complicated Dukun is there. I'm going to stumble and fumble but we'll have fun. <laughs> okay, when you're kids, you're running through the ravine and you, I had a ravine in my backyard. After the backyard, there was just a ravine we used to explore, you know, find, tur I don't know, turtles and chimpanzees. <laughs> Whatever exists in a, a ravine. Tar. There was tar there, I remember that. Come Rabbi Elazar Vahamar, Amar, oh, Abba Abba, Amai Itmar Bayyema, Kadma de Sukkus. Why does it say regarding the first day of Sukkus? Well, Kachtem Lacham Bayyema Rishan, on the first day of Sukkus, take for you a pre eighth Hadar. It says in the Ikra, Chavkim Ogim, it says, take for you a very beautiful fruit from a tree. It goes on, you take it with your right hand, and it represents victory. Masal the Malko. It's like a victory before the king. A military parade, it sounds like. Okay, I'm going to skip around. It says, oh, interestingly, it says, what does the Esrog represent? Prietadar da Esrog. That's the Esrog. The E, Shrinta. It is the Shrina. The Esrog is the Shrina. <laughs> and then it defines what Shrina is. Liba, the heart. It is the main organ of the entire body. Sorry. There are three hadasim, the lulav esrei vade arava, and there's one lulav, and the two willow branches. They're all parts of the body, and they, rep you know, it becomes very relevant to you if you relate to being your emotional life. That's your heart, and it's also the understanding of ideas. Libod b'amza isa. Among them is the heart, I guess. In the, in the middle, it says. I was in the middle. We hold it to the left. The Avarin scher scherle, and the, the limbs of the body surround the heart. And for that reason, the Esrog is referred to as Shechina. Because it's in the center, it's the heart. All the limbs surround it. The heart, what you're, what drives you. What is your love and fear? That's manifest in the heart. You could see that clearly. Watch your heart beat. I don't know for sure if it affects your thinking. Well, it must do. <laughs> but anyways, that part of your thinking is associated with the heart. The heart is the source of that experience. So what drives you? That's the Shechina, that's the Esrog. goes on to explain what the lulav is, that it's the shedra. 
Shidra. It's the spine. The Raza de Lulav, Tzadi Katamar Yifroch. And the, the purpose of the Lulav is to express the idea that a Tzadik will blossom forth like a date palm tree. A date tree. Dal Iyu Kikel Vishamayim of Arts, Vsirgimunkulus, Dachi Vishmai, Vishmai of Ara. Doesn't Diva Yomim? That all in the heavens and the earth, Unculus translate these words that he's, God's name is one in the heavens and the earth. That's what the spine represents, I guess, the hierarchy, the 18 steps up to the ladder towards heaven, the stairway to heaven. That's, that's, that's the spine, that's the lulav. It's the blossoming forth of the date tree. But that's the idea of unifying heavens and earth. So you, that's where you, if you have a ladder, you have a top and you have a bottom. You have the yin yang, you have heavens and earth. And that represents a fullness. We always speak in Kabbalah about that an Adam is someone who is Zachar and Nukva all the time. Even when he's away from his wife, he has that. In the form of a celestial being, they translated in the amazing translation of the Nazareth. And you wave this thing, to shake it 18 times, but she's sitting amongst the six directions. There's, you know, a die, like dice, has six sides. That's the six dimensions of, of spatial, I don't know, the way, way things take up room. Nizrach Bayud Kevav. The seal of the Mizrach, it seems to be the, the, the um, east, is the Yud Kevav of God's letter, etc. The Shis Havoyas, the east behind Tamne, Srei Asphal. Okay. I'm going to go a bit further because this is not the part that I want. This is a little leading up to what I wanted to say, but I just thought that was geschmack because it was talking about sukkahs. And getting ready for sukkahs is really incredible, but also gives this idea of what shechina is. It's the, the center, all the, the organs surround it. That's shechina. What's the center? What drives you? What animates your whole being, all the limbs around you? That's the heart of you. That's what you fear and what you love. The two forces that drive you. Then it speaks about how we put the lulavs around the Mizbeach, the altar in the base of Migdash. You would stand them erect. Uluman the gun, this natu ilain netin bay. It's like you're planting a garden. The raz de mila the nekeva the seva gaver. There's a pasuk in Jeremiah. There's a verse in Jeremiah. It says, the secret of the matter is encompassed in the verse that says in Jeremiah that the, the feminine surrounds the masculine. Nekeva to save of Gaver. So it takes the word Nekeva nun min gan. The word gan garden has two letters, a gimel and a nun. Okay? The nun is the Nekeva, the feminine of the garden. Gan hu klil tlas vechamshin sidrin varaisa dibiksav. This you get out of Vesheva Yemen de Sukkos. Okay, you get the Torah and you have the seven days of Sukkos. You have 53 Parshas in the Torah, 53 plus the seven days of Sukkos come out of nowhere to fill in. You have the 60 to go against the 60 Mesechtas. They're corresponding to that. Then it goes on. Okay, it's not enough to go to Sukkos. We've got to talk about Shmini Atzeres. Chag Bifnei Atzma. It's a special holiday of, unto itself. Bay Neville de Raisa. That's where the, the terror bubbles forth from Neville? I don't know. Lashkana Ilana, yes. It pours forth to water the tree. The Iu Natua Vagan, which is planted in a garden. Okay, these are beautiful words. This is what you're celebrating in Shemina Terrace. Now shouldn't you know what it's all about? You're selling braiding, the planting of the terror and watering it. In the garden. So there's this whole thing about water and sukkahs. That's what he was talking about before in the celebration of the, of the libation of the water on the altar. The only time of the year you do it. The rest of the time, it's just wine. When you 
line is is, is being the, the heart. It's all related to that. But here, there's something higher than, than that. There's water, which has no taste. You can't understand. It's beyond your ability to appreciate. It's just beyond, ah, transcendent, fundamental. So it starts, you start the whole year with the joy of celebrating water, where you don't take, usually you take joy with wine. That's what he, Grant gives you joy, rather. So you celebrate and you drink wine. Why are we celebrating water? But it's the pleasure of something beyond understanding. That's pleasure associated with water. It's chokhmah, okay? It actually talks about three drops that come from the mind. Okay, it gets really, really kishmak. Forget that far. I know I'm going slow, but it's early. I, I came to you early, <laughs> so we can learn together. I don't know. So it's not a polish here. Big deal. Enjoy it. Enjoy it with me. This guy, kick back and just things are happening in the world. We have sukkahs coming up. You're supposed to start learning about sukkahs 30 days before the the holiday, right? What are we at? The 15th yet? Oh, we're getting there. We're cheating a bit. So it speaks about the best holiday of all. Shemini Tzaris, and then it talks about the Chi, the ninth, which is Simcha's terror, right? But let's just back up a bit to Shemini Tzaris. So it waters the garden. We said what the garden is. We said what, at least, it represents the surrounding Nekeva to save of God there. That's a garden, the surrounding. Being surrounded, being encompassed within. Okay, you could figure out what, what the imagery here is. But it's a garden where there's a tree. But remember, we said in the center is also the heart, which is feminine. That's Bina. Bina is the heart, and it's in the center of all the limbs. Now we describe a garden where the, the Nekeva to save of get, giver. So you have the yin-yang here <laughs> happening in a big way. Figure that one out on your own. I, I, I have other things on my mind right now. But that's, not, that's fascinating. It says, It's source, its source, its roots rather, and its branches extend from, upon this, from this tree that grows from the watering on, on Sukkot, and it grows on, it's like, Kigavna de Chug Haaretz, like the celebration of the of the land, the Chol Chagin Mischagigimba, that all festivals celebrate it. I don't know what it means Chug Haaretz, the celebration of the land is. I think it means that the Yom Tovim go around the whole harvest thing and like, I didn't know what how that, that whole thing works. You plant, you you, you got to know this stuff. Okay, you can't understand Terra without it. Good morning in whatever language that is, Pakistani. So the eighth is the holiday of holidays, but there's something higher. There's the ninth. The rina, that's the song. The da you run into tzaddikim b'ashem. This is expressed in the verse in Tillam. It says the tzaddikim sing, or they just are led. They're so happy that they're led to sing because in their experience of Hashem, b'ashem. Run into tzaddikim b'ashem. The da darga the tzaddik chay almin. This is the level of a tzaddik who is eighteen worlds. Mitaman Rina, from there comes song, Uve Porkana, and that song is a salvation there within these eighteen worlds is salvation. That's for the right for the righteous. That's what the righteous celebrate. That's the ninth day, that's Simcha's Terra. Hadu Hudiksiv Tsemach Tzadik. I love the word Tzadik. Sport sprout forth at Tzadik. Yirmiyo. Umitacht of Yitzmak, Apostle and Zechariah, it says, and beneath him will sprout forth. Mitacht of Vada, it means literally beneath him. Holy the Ew, Asiris the And that, who is beneath him? The tenth of everything. The Tzadik, Natal, Mismala. And the Tzadik takes the, the, the tenth of everything. I think it's referring to the Esrog, because we take the Esrog in our left hand. Bamudo, Bam Tzaisa, we place the Esrog in the middle. Mimina, with the right hand. I guess the right hand's holding in the middle. It's a lulav. We put them together, sort of. I mean, we put it to the left, so. I, I don't know exactly how they're, maybe the middle, the center of the, the width-wise, the thing, but not facing you. I don't know. That could be, from a different angle. It's right in the middle. Vamudda ba'emtsa isa mimina. Hadda hudiksi mimina esh 
das lamai. Then you quote the beautiful pasuk in Devarim. It says, "From his, in his right hand is the lawful fire, lamai forever." I don't know. The lawful fire, which is the ash of terror, the fire of terror, which was black fire on white fire. That's the fire of the terror. We spoke about fire in the temple. That's the celebration of uh, of Sukkot. Is the candelabras that lit up the sky with their underwear? With the tachtainim, the tachtainim were illuminated. The dirabat tachtainim in the literal sense. He, the, Rabbi Wagner just darshaned this. I didn't even make it up. It's a great drush. He heard it from someone. I don't remember for the class. Someone, someone big. Yeah. Someone big. And it goes on and oh, here it's beautiful. Okay, now we get talking about the princess. What is this elusive princess that you have to kill a king to, to be worthy of? David Malik did it. Kill a snake. Did I say a king? <laughs> the king wanted to kill him. He had to kill a snake to be able to get the hand of the princess. David Malik did that. Malka. Right? Michal. Michal, rather. Michal was Shaul's daughter. Michal. Bahau zimna dihain train shmahan kechada. What's shmahan mean? Three names as one. And that time, you have three names as one. Is, I don't know what's talking about the three names. Isara Brato de Malka. I think it will maybe say, well, it goes on to say what they are. The three Yuds. Okay, watch. This is really cool. Okay, I'm sort of learning it with you right now. This is this is in real time, guys. Baozim Nadihain Train Shman Kachada. And this time you get the three names as one. Or Isara Brata de Malka. The princess is awakened. She's aroused. Bishira Shirim Umishle Vakahelas. In what three things is the daughter aroused? In Shira Shirim, the song of songs of Shlom Malik and all Shlom Malik's beautiful works here. Umishle Proverbs, the Kahelas Ecclesiastes. These are the three names as one. Shleisha Alafi Mashal says in in um Malachim Allah, three thousand allegorical stories or metaphors Shlama Malik used to explain every idea. Tlas Yudin. This is represented by or in three letter Yuds. We'll see what those are. The inun tlas tipin de meicha, which are three drops of the brain. You know, it says in Tanya how the ultimate example of ex nihilo creation is done through reproduction in this world, through human reproduction. That it originates, according to Kabbalah, in the brain. Thought is first manifest in a physical way when it goes down the spine. Remember we spoke about the spine, all the parts of the heart. <laughs> okay, it has to all, all comes together. But this is the process whereby you take a thought and make it sort of um, subjected to a process of tzimtzum, a progressive uh, becoming more tangible through this process of going down the spine. I mean, according to Kabbalah and also the Havdil, other Eastern philosophies, has this whole, this whole idea. It's an ancient idea that just was... Everybody sort of knew this. Which leads to inherent guilt about not pro giving that process proper dignity, proper place in your life. There's a whole guilt associated that with, with that that's stigmatized in the world. It's not just the Ten Commandments telling you this and that. It's just part of our consciousness. Good morning. It becomes part of our consciousness, this idea, throughout history, in all cultures, basically. I mean, even if they completely ignore it, still they know, and that's actually what they enjoy about it. It's the, it's the um, what's it called? Transgression. The fascination with transgression. It's like these forces, like the church and, the, and the, those forces in the world sought to make a line just so they could break the line. If that's your only purpose in making a line, like once you get to the top and you don't care about what anyone thinks about you and then you break all, every rule. 
then didn't you just make the line so that you can like get to the position where you don't care? You say, Cushion took us to the world and you break every line. Isn't that the whole purpose? So, so the flip side of that is something very precious. It becomes the most inner chamber, the, the actual most holy, sanctified place of the temple. You have the two crewmen embracing. And look at the way it describes the way they're embracing. The same term that's used here is Ara Brata de Malco. Here it's talking about the princess. What is she aroused by? Shlomo Melech's 3,000 Mashalim expressed in the three works, Shira Shira Mishle and Kohalas. Those are three yuds, which look at the shape of a yud. It's supposed to represent the sperm that begins in the tlas tip in the meicha, in the brain. The nachasin min yud, that they descend from a yud. Ul'an ismachshu legabe tzadik. And where is it drawn with respect to the tzadik? The iu keshes habris. That's in the bow. Or rather... The covenant of the bris. Umada have a cotton. It's the same word here. I think it means a kesha. You'll see why it means a bow. It means a bow and arrow. It means it means a rainbow. It means everything. The word, words in Hebrew are very, very rich. And you've got to realize that they're speaking to you on a lot of levels at the same time. And that's the whole point. They wanted to code. This. I heard this from Rabbi Chaim Miller. But, but I've heard this from other places now since I heard him from, the, from Rabbi Miller. He says that Kabbalah is a code they didn't want everyone to have access to it. What I'm doing now? Tar and feather in those days. You can't do this. It's completely inappropriate. Nowadays, it's a mitzvah legalized zaysa chofmo. That's what it says in the Arizal's time. But it still wasn't a mitzvah to do it like the way I'm doing it. It's crazy. Historically, it's insane. Completely insane. Do I think it's needed? Yeah, more than ever. Definitely now, people have to be doing this. They have to find the parts of Torah that have the most kishmak and learn that. Why do you have to learn the most difficult part of the, the Torah and only stay on that? You don't have any appreciation. The ox scores, the bull, the bull, the god. The, 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 why are you talking about? Learn what it's about. What is this? I could talk about a bull. I've spoken about a bull, the Shara Bar. Isn't that an awesome idea? A giant bull in a cave somewhere. Like, he's like, King Kong would be terrified. Only Leviathan's not terrified of this bull. Earthiness personified. Leviathan is spirituality personified. And they slug it up. They slug it out. They slug it out. They fight. They have a gladiator fight to amuse the tzaddikim. Okay, whatever. That is an awesome topic. And I just, I can't just touch on that. But I'm talking about even something that I've been searching for this for a long time. I mean, David Melech went out there, conquered, killed the snake, got the princess, bride. So what arouses this princess? Okay, because we're, we're just we're really this is before we even mentioned that killing the, the snake. I didn't even get to that yet. I'm, it's the next part. I'm, I'm almost there. Okay, so I'm just having fun on the journey. Because it's a journey she it's Aura Brata de Malka. I love how the word Brata has the word brat in, in it. They have to be related. <laughs> okay, so she has the three sources of her inspiration. The princess, what is she into? She's not into just weaving, because weaving is like the feminine thing. It's entirely okay. Don't get me started. I got to this whole thing through the concept of a weave and through postmodern philosophy, and I spoke, speak about that imagery a lot. Ichuya Alexandria. What does it mean? Chesikala? Ichuya Alexandria, the weave of fabrics that, to bind something, things so you don't see there was ever any difference between them. It's a total union. That's the Chesikala, the weave, the Alexandrian weave, the type of bond. That's a sister. The word he in Hebrew for his sister is achot, achot, achais, right? We say, achaisi kala. My sister, my bride. How can you associate anything bridal with your sister? But if you're very close to someone, you see them as your sister. But also the idea of sister, chesed, who the rabbi, why, why Jacobson is an amazing share on that. Chesed, who, why does it say the word chesed? It's a kindness. You can't do it because it's a kindness. It's a chesed. It's awesome. You have to look that up. I can't do it now. So the Yud represents the seminal point, the shape of it even. 
And where does it go? It goes to the Tzadik. The Yukeshes Habris. The covenant of the bow. Umada have cotton is ave godol. And there's this process of becoming what's small gets large. You interpret that. I don't know what's talking about. The Raza de Mila Shefar. The secret of the Mila, or the secret, I don't know if it means the matter. Mila, the word mean, Mila means the matter. You don't refer to the male organ in Hebrew. We have Lashon Kadesh. There is no word. The holy tongue does not have a word for the male and female reproductive organs. It doesn't have a word for it. The, the, the terror has to deal with this because they have to speak about it in terms of Hilchus, Hilchus Nida has to describe the whole thing in, in great detail. They have to talk about anatomy. And they don't have any words for anything. So they give a muscle. of the walking into a... Okay, <laughs> look up their muscle. It's, it's fascinating. Because there's no words. The holy tongue does not have words for these things. There's something holy about Yiddishkai, even from the language. The, the, the kumas is, is a, an ornament that princesses would wear, let's say, that was a golden ornament that would say kan makum zima. Look that up, what that means. Kumas. Go, and they dedicated to this, this is based in English. The Raza de Mila Shefar, Heilach Pazar Godel. It, the Shefar, spreads out. It, it goes on to be, how do you say sound that spreads out? It, it just resonates, it reverberates through the world in an expansive way that's the Shefar. Masayehe Zarek Chait Bediukna Da. So when does the Shafer blow? <laughs> That's when it shoots the arrow in this form. The Diyukna Da Tziur translates it into this form. So you have a princess who's aroused by wisdom of the Torah, Shir Shirim Mishle and Kahelis, and that is, represents, what are, why three? Because there's a male component here that comes from the brain, that, and there's a whole process where it has its symptoms, it becomes more magushim, it becomes more physical, goes through the spine. It doesn't mention the spine here, but we've said the spine before. And, we, and obviously, it's, I mean, the Tanya here is totally talking about the same thing. And it's drawn to the Kesha Sabris, into the Tzadik. So you have this whole union that comes about, and then, then there's this cotton, this Avid Gado, it grows. And it acts like a shafar that's Zarek Chait. It shoots an arrow. Okay. This is the terror. This is Tikkun Azar. Pasuk Rav Shimon V'Amar. So Rav Shimon, the Holy Rash, Rashbi, says, Eloin is staknu v'izdarzu v'mane krovo l'gabe chivya. The supernal realms... Are, were corrected, are corrected. I didn't know his darzu, what that means. Bemane krova lega bechivya. Those who approach the snake. So I guess you're corrected. There's a heroic act of approaching the snake that you correct everything with. Diyum mekanino beturin ravravin. That this snake nestles in great mountains. Or in Rav Ravin, I don't know if it means many or great. I think it means many. And this is what killed the first man. This snake that nestles in a mountainous terrain killed the first man. And all the forthcoming generations of Gindo and on account of this snake that killed the first man and harmed all of the generations to follow. There is a voice that echoes out from heaven every single day urging you to go out and kill this beast, this monster, this killer. The psychopathic killer. You're you to go out and face your darkest, deepest fears. 
There's a clarity in the moonbeams. Darkness appears as darkness. There's a clarity in recognizing where is the snake? He's in these mountains, these things that you look up to. Those things that you look up to, the dark mountains. In other places in Kabbalah, it speaks about the dark mountains. Here it says these many multitudinous mountains. I think it's going to say that they're large also later. There's a, a heavenly proclamation that goes every single day. The one who comes to slay the dragon. The serpent, the dragon's lair, the dragon's slayer, and of the princess. The Iu Miknana Baturin Ravravin, Yahavin lay brought to the Malko. This serpent who lives in these great mountains or these many mountains, you give that person, this hero, the hand of the princess. So what is this elusive princess? How, you can only get, if you're the most heroic person in the world, what do you get? What is this princess? It's Lysa. It's davening. Could you think of something more beautiful, romanticized? Avedis Hashem in such a way. The whole source for all of romance and fantasy that drives a lot of people throughout history you know, you didn't have to have a fantasy world before because that's the world they lived in of swords. And, and this is, we talk about toxic masculinity. Oh my goodness, are the world is so civilized now? Comparatively, okay, we've had moments. The Russians coming back from this Second World War. Horror, what they did. Horror. Okay, those are the good guys. What the Russians did in our, in our host countries of the Jews after they were conquered by the Nazis, Yomak Shavam, what they did to us voluntarily. Horror. So there's a lot of, there's many dark mountains in the world. So to encourage you to go out and slay the darkness, the embodiment of the darkness, because the only thing, the darkness is not going to harm you. It's not talking about darkness here. It's talking about these, I don't know, Turin Ravravin, these great mountains. Let's call it great. I don't know if it means many here are great. These great mountains. The darkness is not going to hurt you. These great mountains are not going to hurt you. All right, you go slowly. Take it. No one, die, unless it's, I don't know. Okay, you could die getting just getting to the, the snake. It's a whole adventure to get there. You have to be brave enough to even go through the, this, this great mountains to get to the same. What do you get when you get to the top? Finally, you're there. You're facing this primordial creature that, that killed on the Mauritians. So now you're going to come can't stop it? <laughs> you can tell me the Brata de Malk all you want, but I'm going to think of her as a, you know, what? The Brata de Malk. I'm not going to say, no way. Forget it. She's probably not very well. She's not very, probably not very refined. Maybe she's uh, arrogant being the princess. I, I'm not going to go there. I don't, I'm terrified, in other words. But what is this thing that you're terrified of? In the fate of Hashem, what's it talking about? The Tikkun Nazareth tells us. It's davening. You're afraid to face yourself. You're afraid to say, what do I care about? That comes from God. I love you, God. That's what Phil is. Just think about all the things you care about. Whatever it is. I care about, I don't know. I care about sitting on a lawn chair and basking in the radiance of the glow, of the glory of Whatever. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Whatever you like to... Okay, so you like to be the guy that's setting the lawn chairs up. You like to be very proactive. You like to manage the... the whatever it is, whatever your thing is, whatever rules your life, whatever is the um, focus, the focal point of your, the heart of your life, the center of all the, the limbs is the heart, it's the asra, it's the shechina. Whatever is your shechina, that's available through the idea of what a princess is, which is prayer. So how so? Think about all the things that are precious to you and say, where does that come from? That's another way of saying, I believe that there's a creator. Everyone believes that, right? Not that stupid to think that this is just some cosmic accident. Like my watch came together as an accident. And as if this is as complicated as the molecules like, that make up the watch. Come on. 
that's it's it's a silly idea. You have to get into the whole idea of like parallel universes to say that one of them is real. I don't, you have to really stretch your imagination to say that it's just a fluke. There's all these parallel universes that wouldn't have humanity or consciousness, and in this one where everything went right perfectly, there was the evolution of consciousness. And therefore, you don't need to say that there was something before the Big Bang. You don't need to say the creator. But once you say that there's a creator, it's very easy to translate those things that are precious to you, the diamonds in the sky, the princess's hand in marriage, the Shrina. It's easily to translate that Shrina. I asked this kid, are you allowed to worship the Shrina? He says, yeah, we, that's why we delve into the East. The Mizrach is mentioned here, right? I don't know, in that context, it's probably the way, because in, in the times of the base of Migdash, East represented where the God, so to speak, faces out towards the East. And it's like the sun coming up and bowing down before God. And all the celestial, everything bows down to God. So what is this? It's prayer. That's the princess. It's prayer. You face up to the fact that everything you love in life, it could be a relationship, you love a person, you love your dog. Your dog is the greatest, it's your best friend in the whole world. And so you, you know what? That dog has a creator, is a soul, right? You really believe that it's so, I saw a thing, someone, they married, they're, they're proud to say they married their dog. Their legal marriage in Norway, I believe. That's fa fa fantastic. Don't ask her about any details about it because that's not, that's improper to, to speak about, but she wanted to let the world know that she's married a dog. Okay, if it didn't happen in the world that it came to my attention. In the olden days, before Clinton, nothing came on the news. You could talk about news in school. In high school, we just talk about current affairs. Until when Clinton happened, I don't know how to talk about current affairs anymore. The whole news thing just descended. It jumped off a cliff. And now you could talk about anything in public media and you could... In public, like news media, I mean. Okay, the world's changed a lot. So that's prayer. The princess is prayer. Deceive al Magdala. The princess sits in the tower. On <laughs> top of the tower is this treasure chest, which is the princess. Deit marba migdal is shem Hashem. A tower of might, the name of God. There, the tzaddik runs to, to grasp. That's like a mishle, okay? There we, that's, this is arouses the princess's mishle. It's one of the three things, one of the three yuds, the, the counterpart, the male counterpart of this process. The two has to, have to come together. So she's she relates to the intellect and the romance behind Shir, Shir Shirim, Mishle, and Kahalas. And in, in the physical manifestation, like the man is much more physical, she's much more spiritual, she's thinking Tara. And what's he doing? He's got, he's, he's, he has three Yodim in his, in his brain. Three letter Yods. And that's the yin yang there. So the woman spiritualizes and the, the man descends. The Chokhmah, the Yud, represents Chokhmah. The wisdom, the highest level of the intellect. That descends and becomes the most physical thing that's brought about. To the, it's, it's expressed in the most physical way possible. The Kashta Lishana de Puma. And we talk about this bow. Remember we were speaking before in more graphic terms? But now it becomes the tongue. Or the language, the same word in Hebrew. Here it's Aramaic. Lishana de Puma, the tongue of the mouth or the language of the mouth, I don't know. Ageza de Kashta de Puma. It's the nuts in the Kashta de Puma? I don't know. Ageza means nuts. The Kashta, I guess that means the tongue of the mouth. It's a nut, I don't know. Because <laughs> Chuta Shani Chut Shal Keshes. A tongue of crimson it's called, uh, in English we have the word a tongue of crimson like a tongue of a material it's, it's a, a chut here is like a um, strip a strip of crimson fabric chut shal keshes is a bow it's a strand of a bow I guess it's the string, I don't know devei hava tzadik zarik chitzin that through this through this 
um, string attached to the, the arrow, the bow and arrow, the bow rather, that the tzaddik uses to shoot out arrows. Okay, so how does the tzaddik shoot arrows? Through his mouth in prayer. These things are totally immersed in very graphic language so that you could have some way to relate to it. It's the most tangible thing that you could probably relate to, unless you're not that type of guy. You're into other things. You're into food. You're, there's other Mishalim. But the Kabbalah is richest in this area. You, could just, you just can't, can't escape it. I pick up any Zayar, any piece of Kabbalah, it always comes back to the same thing because it's, they recognize this is a force that drives particularly men. This is why the man is the whole process of descending. Okay, his tendency is going to be has to come down. Okay, I have that all the whole talked about that concept that the man is aloof so that's like contradictory his tendency is to be aloof so that he could be a good person that's why god made an azer connected to draw him down so that to be a good person what does god want you to be you're forced to be in the world so i'm going to make that part of you come out it's a yin yang process whereby it's there's this there has you have to be a cruiser there has to be a proclam, heavenly proclamation every day reminding you that there's a princess awaiting you in a tower What's the princess? It's prayer. How is it expressed? Because the tzaddik shoots arrows. He shoots... He says that the tefillah is a war. So what does he shoot? He shoots arrows from his tongue, from his mouth. With the silk tongue. It's the string that you pull back on, that shoots zarik chits and arrows, which are the words of prayer. That's your relationship to God in prayer. It's the most intimate possible spiritual experience. So you have to use terms that express something intimate so that language resonates, because you have to hint about this in ways that make sense. So that if you're going to come with an allegory, don't use one just to tiptoe around the tulips, but rather... Call a rose a rose and a spade a spade. And when there's, there's moonbeams, the darkness appears as darkness. You get the light from the darkness. It's the clarity that it's the temple of flame. It was the clarity that you could even sift through things to see. I don't know what they're looking for. Bugs. Or, I don't know what. I can't remember. They sifted through their grain. If we knew what, what food was, we would understand what that was immediately. They, they took out something. I don't know. Pebbles. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, so he shoots arrows. Where does he shoot the arrows? He doesn't slay the he, the dragon slayer. The dragon slayer that he approaches, the dragon slayer does not use a sword. He uses arrows to kill the, the serpent. I never knew that. The bay have it sadik zara hits in the inun me lulin that slays the lagabachivya. He shoots arrows at the snake. He doesn't even have to go to the darkness of the mountains, maybe. He shoots from afar. My Rabbeinu climbed the mountain and what? I think one step, he went up the whole mountain. So you can like, and the whole idea of an arrow is that you could shoot far away. So that's, I mean, it's expressed that in my marm and Yitzhak's kiss. The inun milun that slays the gab achivya. Achivya lehav v'chashiv lein. I think it means he's not afraid of this, the serpent. V'la begin chalisha de tzadik chayalmen. I think it means he doesn't care that he's being shot arrows at. I don't really understand this, I have to be honest. It says, He doesn't care about these arrows being shot at him, is that what it's saying? Or he doesn't care about this hero that's come to shoot arrows at him. The love begin chalisha. Chalisha means weakness. It's not for the sake of the weakness. Of the tzaddik chayalmin. I don't know what that's talking. About. The tzaddik of the eighteen worlds. Ella begin chalisha da'ali the zarik line. It's because of the the weakness of the one that shoots the arrows. The tzaddik the lasatumine. That's a lower level tzaddik. The 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 lasatumine. Can love you shlim when he's not whole. Again, do lo chashiv line, and that if, if he's not whole, he can't kill the serpent. Ad asa raya mehemna. Oh, so every person that came was too weak to be able to do this until Meishur Beinu came, came the faithful shepherd. 
faithful shepherd's more than just saving sheep. He saves. He's a real hero that goes to fight to, off to fight the dragon in its lair. But not till Chetz Chad Mezarek Legami takes a sharp arrow and shoots it at the snake. This is the ultimate <laughs> narrative of like heroism. This is after his fill off. And you follow Chetz Kavede de Chivya. What does a pal- palach mean? A heavy arrow hits the snake, I think it says, they use Samach Mem Aleph Lamed. I don't want to say that name. That is an angel. Like, let's just call him Uncle Sam, okay? Ke'il Acher refers to him. The other side, the, the deity of an, the representing, or not the deity, Shalom, the, the Malach that represents Ke'il Acher. Sounds like a horror show. That's really... That sounds really whoa. The salmon you say divi kare. Oh, kvedo is it as gizzard, his liver? Kvedo the chivio, I've translated as heavy, but it could mean, I think it means here actually is his, um, his liver. <laughs> you shoot him in the liver, you give him like, you say, look, I am with the serpent. You shoot him in the liver. Kvedo, kvedo the chivio. You follow chaits, kvedo the chivio. I don't know. Do you. That's where its foundation is, and its root is what is Feide de Chivya, his 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 liver. I don't know. Begin da hakabe kaiyas. That's why anger is associated with the liver. The my kaiyas, the mara diu dvukabe. It is angry at the bitterness or the the bile rather that it cleaves to. So the liver. Has, is associated with bile, and it cleaves to the, the so the, the disgusting bitterness, the thing, what is it angry at? The thing that it cleaves to. The, it's the addict that can't get away from his thing. Okay, remind me to put this on the addictions page. Veda sam hamavis nukfa delay. And that is, remember we called it a yisayid, yisayid of ikare, and this is, is poison, and it's its feminine aspect. Sama Mavis Nukfa delay. Znava delay Yeseris a covered. Its snake is the like extremity of its liver. It's the expression of its liver, it seems to say. Yeseris Iskrias. The Vasta de Ividas Neufin Yehivas Shiurun Levile. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here because it's getting a bit hard and it's, it's getting really like racy too. And if, if I get it wrong, that's it's not. Okay, it goes on though. It says, after you shoot it in the liver, Zera Yerik Achetz Legabe Kalo. That's when seed is emitted like an arrow towards the bride. Yud Zera Dismashek Mine Bedel Zion. That's the Yud that we spoke about before that's drawn from it, Bedel Zion. And it is Zion. So the Zion represents masculine usually. Right? Zachar. So you have the Nun of Gan. This, you call it the garden because it surrounds. I think that the garden was surrounded the, the center, which is the, where the, the, the um, tree of life was, right? In the center of the garden. Zeriyo So then the arrow shoots towards the bride. Yud zero this mashik mineva does Zion. The Zion represents this whole process. If you see, meet Marba, speaks about the letter Zion. The Shalach Lila Matara, the Davas Ayin, base Kibul, Kibul, the Zera, the Yu Zion Vadai. The Davas Ayin, base Kibul, the Zera, the Yu Zion Vadai, my Matara, the Yerach Ben Yemai, the one day moon. Sira the Kadisha, the holy sanctified moon. You sanctify the moon in the beginning of the month. Matari iu vade levasayin. Nakuda zirum logavd. It's beautiful. It seems to be talking about moonbeams. Vasayin. That's the pupil of the eye. I don't know. I'm going to stop here because I'm not... I think you get the point where this is going. It goes on and on. You got a snake. You got a tail. I translated kveda as liver. Where the bile is associated with the liver, I think, right? Mara, Mara Shkara is bile. 
so it's angry because it's cleaving to the bile, the bitterness of the world. People that are stuck in toxic um, mindsets and toxic relationships and toxic environments. Like it could be a workplace. It could be, you got to shut up those voices. If you can't do it through your own ability to transcend things, through having a very focused attitude and very disciplined, um, you're not very influenced, you're not very empathic maybe, or maybe you're empathic and you're very strong at the same time. So let's summarize. The one who kills the snake, the heroism of, what did I call it? The hand of the princess, to win the hand of the princess, to have prayer. It says it's Rai Mahemna is the secret of this, is Maisha Rabbeinu. No one could do it, no one had the strength to do it until Maisha Rabbeinu, who's incidentally the, the, spoke, the one we mentioned, was the one that climbed up the mountain, one jump, he jumps up the, the, the mountain at one leap. Okay, that's the way Maisha Rabbeinu tackles problems. <laughs> yeah, I got I gotta get up to the top of the mountain. I'm gonna jump up the top of the mountain. I'm gonna jump to the top of the mountain. Oh my sure Bain, he's gonna fight, you know. If you're gonna have to if decide if there's a, a snake in, in your way, I don't care if the snake kills Adam or Ishan, I don't care how powerful it is. My sure Bain was more powerful. And what was his power? What did we say Ryan Hammond's power was? I can't find that right now, but the important thing here is that we're empowered by this bas call. The whole point of a bas call, of a voice echoing out from the heavens, of an echoing sound, a resonation from heaven. In other words, that we have see clarity in our life. It's the moonbeams. We know how moonbeams appear dark, specifically at nighttime. You see the brightness of the moon. Darkness appears as darkness. You could say, this is dark, this is light. You have clarity. It's the the temple of flame with the candelabras leads, lends itself to clarity. So if you have the clarity, you could, uh, uh, it gives the person strength. The, the heavenly voices is intended as a means to tap into an energy, to strength. It's the Elio and Navi that makes you desire Mashiach. We spoke about at length. It's the, the voice that's saying, there is a prize here. There is the power to do succeed in, in Davening. I, yes, I'm going to succeed. I'm going to actually succeed in Davening, and that is the hand of the princess. That is a connection to God. Oh, here's about Ryan Nehemna. I'm going to interrupt the channel for an important sponsor from Maisha Rabbeinu. Ryan Nehemna, this faithful shepherd, not till chaitz chad v'zarek legavi. He takes a sharp arrow. Here it has the word chad. It's sharp. And he sends it towards the thing. He, maybe it knows the secret. Until it pierces the liver of the snake, which is its feminine yisaid. So you have this, there's a counterpart of intimacy whereby it's an expression of love, but here's an expression of violence towards the evil. So just like you have an attraction towards the positive, you have to have that much power and Dis despising the evil to face the evil, to identify it, to have the clarity to identify the evil, to know what the things that are evil and toxic are, and not be afraid to go there, to go up to the mountain, to do it in one leap like a, a hero, the real hero of all heroes, like Maishu Rabbeinu, the, the faithful shepherd who's not afraid, and he goes there, and he has a secret. He's got a sharp arrow, and he knows where to hit, the, 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 where the, the opposite of the, the, the goodness of it. You know, he knows the target, the bullseye, is the flip side of that, the poison of the nukma delay, is expressed as anger, which is addiction to mara, to bitterness. You're angry at yourself by, by that you're too stuck in bitterness and dark things, and things that you know are bad for you an addiction. So you're angry at yourself or you're angry at others. You express you might take it out on others. Near the, the snake is not a good guy. He's a killer. Killed out of a reason. He's so angry. Right? So embittered with his addiction. So he takes it out on others. But that's Mamas Nukfa delay. And that's the expression of the feminine negative aspect of Nukfa the Yesaid. I think it's talking it's the Salman Yesaid of Ikare. It's its the foundation and its root. The Ikra, and it relates it to its Nava delay, it's there, it's a covet. To it, it's, it's the Ikra, it's the root, it's, I actually have a shake, you have the, you have the, 
this, this disgusting imagery of expressed in what's that square Bob square pants square whatever his name is that disgusting cartoon that I don't let my kids watch because it's completely inappropriate in terms of their phallic representation but here the Zaire is the Tikkun Zaire says Znavo delay Yisera is a covet its snake this phallus is, is an extension of its covet it's its anger the nukfa the Yisaid and the Ikar the root, so you have this image of a root, which is not a feminine image, it's actually masculine, but it's, it's it, that's the tail. It's expressed, and remember, remember, uh, Vashti had a tail. This is what it was, it's not like, he, he's, uh, how do you know what these things mean unless you finally you look it up in, in Kabbalah? Marad iu partsuf delay. It has a bitter expression on its face. I'm translating. Okay, it's a bit embellished. Ye seras zon of delay. It's ex proboscis of this phallic tail, which is not feminine, but it represents this, the inner coming out expresses a tail, like vashti. Gegavna to adam. It's like lashes out at the man. To avid like parts of levasar zon of. To high adam ra iskre. He has a fascination with his tail. So who's going to be attracted to this toxic environment of the serpent? This feminine aspect. The side of the feminine and the negative. You get the positive. You get the princess, bri the princess bride. Through this process of facing the negativity. The feminine negativity in the world. Okay, it, means, it doesn't mean female. It doesn't mean that. It's talking about a, about the bitterness of being addicted to something that's bitter to you. You recognize it as bitter, and you can't get away from it. So you lash out at others. You lash out with the tail. It's an extension of this bitterness. It's an expression of the, this bitterness. And that goes, in, in a, and this is only effective to someone who's fascinated by that. If you're fascinated by the dark aspect of the feminine side, you, ex, you become vulnerable to the effects of the... The, the snake that affected all the generations. We're suffering today from the weakness in this area. I know people that are very sensitive to this and they express this verbally, that they find men so weak that they have to like, do all this and not let women express themselves how they want to. Yes, there should be rebounding. Yes, they should set standards. And if people ignore those standards, guess what? They're out of the fold of your influence. Deal with that and don't treat them like they're... I mean, I saw a video... Of a, of a lady who felt so uncomfortable and amongst, she's in a subway with all these men. Okay, maybe she, they should make laws. I don't know. I'm not the one that's going to dictate those things. But there are cultural laws anyways. And she felt it. She felt so... Oh, I have a story that I could tell that's just horrific. horrific. But it's similar to this. It happened. Yeah, whatever. I don't know what I'm going to tell. But I saw this video. Okay, it went viral, this video. I got in front of my eyes somehow. It, so she was so offended, so like not from, like this is not, I don't know if she's Jewish, certainly not from, but she was angry by feeling so different. So she takes her purse or her hand and hits one of them on the tukhs and then runs out of the subway or walks out of the subway rather. And they were horrified, okay? I'm just saying that that's the expression of the stigmification and the fascination that underlies the need for so many gdarim. Yes, you need to have gdarim. You have to have fences. You have to have fences of roses even, which is with the people that you're already intimate. You still have boundaries. Still have respect for someone's dignity and their and what what's important and what their sensitivities are. And you express them always, particularly in these areas when people feel most vulnerable. So, But the vulnerability to succumb to this type of darkness where there's a, an addictive, a toxic personality that lashes out at others with this proboscis of a tail, that's only possible if the person's drawn to that. He has a fascination with such things. This beastly representation of femininity. The snake. You'd think that that was a masculine eye. You know, a snake is like seems like a mask. Here we're saying no. The tail of the snake, what defines the snake, really? Or the dragon, if you will. Whatever you want to think about. That's this feminine you say, negative you feminine. Okay, there's a positive. Karasabias has a very positive. That's a bracha. You should be a karasabias, the root. 
Okay, does that, is that imagery now ruined forever to be the root of the home? How is a root a feminine image? But here we see it's associated with the inside coming out in a negative way. It's the covet. It's the, the covet is associated with bitterness. So, but what do we say about the covet? The problem is that it's, it cleaves to it. It's this fascination, the feminine fascination. It's a vulnerability. So it exists in men, obviously. And it appears that way as a vulnerability to weakness towards what you want addictions, things that you, you crave and know that they're bad for you, you know that they're, they're bitter. So instead of putting yourself in the time of owls, a time for introspection, but the, the angry, the negative way is to be bitter at somebody else and lash out at them. You have to work on yourself. If you have to lash out at anyone, don't, don't lash out at yourself either. Okay? Be, have compassion on yourself, but be honest with yourself. That's the bala bias. It's when you know yourself. It goes on and on. It's beautiful. I'm going to stop here. I think I summarized enough. Now it's the only repetition. Repetitious, isn't it? Okay, I went on. Oh, that was a bandwidth one. That was a heavy bandwidth one. But it was worth that bandwidth. Oh my goodness. That would be someone like, I should put a sign up like raising. I mean, Nachum Foyer would do that for you. He would make a sign. Let's raise money for the bandwidth thing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm very honored to pay for extra bandwidth, to be able to speak to you a little bit longer. And even though it ruins my filibit seaboard, which is very important, I feel, figure, I have to, I have to dub my way, so I don't know. I'm different, right? I'm making myself a, some kind of shepherd, right? So therefore I'm different. I can jump up the mountain and kill the snake. And I, want to, I hope to dab in like, Intensely, but I usually, I usually come out of this exhausted, and I can't dub him because I'm too exhausted. But I gotta, I gotta be that. The faithful shepherd is no like, like, like pastoral kid. Okay, Devin Melek was a a, a, a shepherd. My Shabbat was a shepherd. He also was heroic. You know, saving Tzipora's future wife. He does the heroism thing, right to win his his. Wife sand in, in marriage, right there. He had, to, <coughs> he had to face his snake right there. Kill it or push it away, scare it off. They didn't make such a big deal there about saying it's right man, but, that, but that's that refers to my Bain. Because they didn't talk about my Bain there very much there. The point is the arrows, what are they? It's the words of Tefillah. Okay, so don't, I have a, a talk about get your head out of the gutter. I think I did dr I addressed that issue a little bit here. Head in the gutter, I think was my header over there. Take, take a look about that. You know, because I know that I'm speaking about a lot of racy topics here, and sometimes people point that out, and they're, they're, it's like, bugs, bugs, up. okay. So don't watch it, I don't know. I'm making a niche. I think that it's a topic that will resonate with a lot of people. I, and I think that, um, you know, everyone has their dark phoenix, their diamond, their thing that they're drawn to. And you could find a whole... I think that this is one area that probably a lot of people <laughs> have a fascination with. I know because I hear about people having problems in, in areas associated with this. Yeah, I have no problem. But, but, I'm, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I, I know that it's very pervasive. And therefore, to not speak about something that's so pervasive is a travesty. So I'm not so meek as to ignore a problem. I'm not so meek to shut up at a Fabringen when I have something that I have to say. Okay? I'll get a herring thrown at me. Okay, I deserve it. You're right. You are right, but it's important to me. It's worth the herring, and it's worth to get thrown. I'll accept it with love. I'm not going to be offended. You have your thing. If you control the room, you deserve the room. And therefore, I respect your office. Not even, I respect you as a person. And I respect your office. I'm telling, I'm talking to the future guy who's going to kick me out of the next for bringing Because I'm, I'm trying to make a coup d'etat. Great. Who is this vagabond coming in here? This, this Sasquatch. Trying to just, jumping on the table. I, I don't jump on the table. I've seen people do it with theatrics to boot and it's glorious. It's, you know, Rabbi Lipsker, 
his theatrics are so polished. But not because he polished them, just because he's like a very genuine person. Real Hasidim are very genuine. That's how you can really identify. You, they might not be a tzaddik, they might be a Russia even. But you could be a Hasid, you can't be a Hasid if you're a Russia. Okay. They could be someone who has a lot of problems, but they're genuine. They, they're very sensitive about their problems. You could be a Hasid and be like that. You don't... It's foolish to think that you can't be a Hasid until you're a tzaddik. It's foolish. Being a Hasid is the most real way that you have a chance of becoming a tzaddik. Okay? People even talk about the whole journey towards being a tzaddik is silly. They don't even like to talk about it. I think that's silly and misses the whole point. Why in the world do you have a heavenly voice telling you about Bratta de Malka? Telling me about the princess bride? The, 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 I'm giving away the, the greatest lottery in the world. It's not a lottery, actually. It's a challenge. It's a real, you have to face your darkest fear and kill it with arrows. In other words, pouring out your heart to something that you're passionate about and why you're doing it. What is the inspiration? Brata de Malka. Recognize who you are. Batish guy over who you are. Work with who you are. Specifically there. Stay on that. Don't ever leave that until you conquer that. I brought sources from the Rebbe Shab, Kuntras Avedo. Look it up. This is a real concept. The main things you have fascinations with, for good and for bad, use it for the good, and you just. You're, you became Dark Phoenix. You have all the power in the world. That you just got. the You became a partner in creation and beyond that even. Adshekaralav imi. Till God calls you his mother. It's not a partner-partner relationship. God allows himself to be in a vulnerable position in this sense. I mean, maybe that's a very unique situation to reach the level of God calling us his mother. Me. I, I gotta, that's, I'm doing more research on Blue Nader. Okay, it's a topic one day. This is a topic I've been waiting like five months to do, and I finally found the source and finally dealt with it. I, I hope it was in a geschmack way, and I hope you felt like this is a bit of, if you're into Lord of the Rings or that kind of stuff, I hope this would had that kind of excitement to it too, because you're going off to fight a very, the Jabberwocky of all Jabberwockies is, that would be a good heading for this. I, I, I got to do a whole thing on that one day because my father loves that that car, that, uh, that um, character. Now it's in Wonderland. Okay, have a great day. Have a great Shabbos. And yeah, the whole Elo thing. <laughs> Everyone, you know, Kasima Kasima Teva. And um, I don't know. We're getting we're getting like, hyped. We're getting we're, we're getting really. Should I start speaking about chuva more? I don't know. I like speaking around chuva. I don't like dealing with musr directly. I think you talk around things. You you deal with the negative spaces in between, and the the rest of it just comes more naturally. It's like my friend told me, it's like saying to a kid, "Don't look over there! Don't look over there! Don't look over there!" Where do you think he's gonna look? It's as if you're pointing him to tell him where to look. It's the it's that s snakes tail that Spongebob square pants horrible don't let your kids watch that I'm telling you that is a very sick mind that made me how do I know I firstly I, I'm about you but secondly I read a book I okay I had a, I, maybe it sounds like ridiculous I read one book okay oops, but I did about it was called um, um, I don't know what the name of the book was the seduction of media through, oh, subliminal seduction. That's the name of the book. Look it up. It's an old book. But it t told you, and it gave examples of how the very expensive world of marketing plays with your brain. And it, it gave examples, and it showed exactly what they're trying to do. And then I got, I developed a skill. I could look at a Coca-Cola advertisement and show you all the things that the, an artist did put in there on purpose in order to subliminally affect. They did all these studies and they did all this stuff. It was popular. I don't know, maybe it's not popular anymore because I haven't been looking for these things anymore, but I used to. And um, it's remarkable what, what kind of things are going on. They show how completely out of place these things are and uh, how for sure it was done deliberately. 
And I'm, I'm a graphic artist, so I know that there's ways to like put an image within an image and nobody. They even do this to trace images. If you're stealing artwork from, you could have like dots encoded in it. You, you, it's a sophisticated thing, but the mind picks up things that you don't necessarily are conscious, you're not consciously aware of, but there's a subliminal world. So you, you gotta, if you're gonna tie it in, you gotta find out what that is, what's driving you really work it out at the core and be don't be like this of the world conquer the world work on it inside then you let other people put up the fences you could be the one that respects the fences you respect even if fences are made of roses just respect them don't you know if the culture doesn't let you sit in a certain place try and deal with it you want to change it write letters to the editor try, try start a new movement make your own society make your own culture and do live the way you want to we're trying to respect people's, even if they're freakish. I think some of the things are freakish. I'm sorry, I, I'm just being honest, but that's me. You're entitled to your freakish line. You have yours, I'll have mine. Everything, there's got to be some point that becomes freakish, no? What if you um, you would only live in a cave because you might go within 100 miles of a of a billboard? Would you, would you think that's normal? No, at some point it's freakish. So you decide what's freakish and don't ever, God forbid, be freakish because it's going to make you weird. If you act freakish, your mind will be warped and weird. Be genuine, be normal. Balchubas in particular. Find out what normal is, be that, and be the best that you can. And then try and take steps every day. I want to be a little bit better than yesterday. And whatever you define that, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell people who wear a piggy arm because that they have, they're, they're the worst person in the world. Give me a break. Let that guy work with bad about him. It's so stupid, silly, ridiculous. People get so offended. You, you, you see that he gets their knickers in a twist. You know something's going on there. It's like obvious to anyone with a brain. So work on that. Work it on inside. If you're a rabbi and your your job is to set the standards of what's good about it, I, then okay, maybe you, that's the exception to the rule. You put up a notice. You're the one that's going to be talking. You'll give the most a share and you'll be the one. But everybody else... Mind your own business. I think that, that whoever is going to be the one to define the arbiter of morality in every area, you have to be very sensitive. You have to know who you're speaking to. You have to know what, where they're holding. You have to know a lot of stuff. And you have to be, and that's a big burden and responsibility. And it's very important. And there has to be some lines, um, lines drawn. I mean, the whole thing about women going around topless. That's like denying the fact that it's going to have a negative impact on the vast majority of people. Even women will be offended. There will be a lot of women very offended by that. Maybe there should be special areas where people can express. I don't know. That's If you're a politician, if you're a police, I don't know who deals with these things. But if you're, that's your job, okay, do it. you got to make some rules. You have to decide. I hear both sides of the thing. and uh, You can't just say there's no laws in society at all. I'm going to wear whatever I want. I'm going to wear a, a, um, what's it called? Dental floss, a piece of dental floss on my head or whatever <laughs> on my nose. And I'm going to wear like a tire around my waist. And that's what I'm going to wear. No, someone's going to say, no, we live in a society. You're a caveman. You're a Sasquatch. You're a barbarian. You're the Loch, Loch Ness Monster. You're a King Kong. And you belong over there in the jungle. And you can do whatever you want there. So you have to make some laws. Okay, I'm just going on a total rant. And uh, there must be something compelling me to speak so much. Maybe it's Shabbos. I don't get to speak to you. You, know, this is, you are the... You form like a, a, a place in my psyche. That I, I, I just like... I unload all my thought on you. Thank you. Send me the invoice. Make sure that it's not too big. Give me a deal. Come on, we're friends. I don't know. You should want to give your friend more. I think that you do a service for your friend, pay him more. <laughs> Everyone else is trying to cut corners, like cut out the middleman. Why do I need you? I'll go get a car and like, I'll just order it online. What do I need you for? No, give the middleman. Let the middleman make a living. Don't be afraid to play a broker. Don't ask the brokers to uh, suck in their fees. What do you tell you? You're asking him to beg you not? I mean, come on. It's just like a power trip. These are the richest people that do this. The richest people. Why? 
Because, so what are they doing? They don't need the money. I'm always fascinated why rich people care so much about spending money or maybe someone else is going to benefit from your money. Why are they specifically... <laughs> money shouldn't mean anything. So I think that it's a, it's a way to establish some uh, social advantage underlying it. They might even give in, okay, I'll pay you your commission. But they just establish, you know what? You're a broker, you're a middleman, and I'm an investor. I feel cool, I feel important. And I'm gonna let you know that I want, I'm in that position. If you want to you just did another 10,000 bucks, another 50,000 bucks to the bottom line, you have tons of money, you'll make a lot of money here. This is what people do. I see it again and again. And yeah, I went on another rant. There's my business ethics 101. Well, it's not 101, it's a specific topic. Okay, so everyone have a good Gaben Shabbos. And I'll see you uh, in Shemaim and Tefillah in five minutes.